This is Sciographies, an introduction to the people who make science happen. I'm your host, David Barkley. I'm an oceanographer with the Faculty of Science here at Dalhousie University. And on Sciographies, I interview different types of scientists about what shaped their interests, their career path, and how they get their research ideas. Thanks for joining us. In this special alumni episode, done in partnership with Dalhousie's Open Dialogue Live series, we talk to Dr. Will Burt. He's a chemical oceanographer and the chief ocean scientist of Planetary Technologies, a carbon removal company headquartered right here in Nova Scotia. Dr. Burt did his PhD here at Dow and now partners with the university to study an ocean-focused climate solution called Ocean Alkalinity Enhancement. It's an approach that harnesses the ocean's natural ability to capture and store carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Dr. Burt talks to us about discovering his interest in oceanography and the ocean acidification problem, leaving academia to work in industry, and what it's like to be on the front lines of fighting climate change. So, why does your Dow Oceanography Intramural Team jersey, number two, hang in the Dow Oceanography Student Lounge? Okay, so I started... Uh, at the Dallas Oceanography Department in 2009. There was no intramural sports of any kind, uh, which I'm fundamentally opposed to as a human being. Mm -hmm. So I launched a team. I called the person organizing. He said, you need to give me a team name Mm -hmm. right there on the phone. And so I I said, give me an hour. And Sea Dogs was the uh, choice I came to. The other choice for those listening, was Oceans of Talent. <laughs> uh, but I was told that was a poor choice. So we went with Sea Dogs, yeah. and therein was the, the birth of that uh, yeah. franchise. Okay, so that brings me back to where I really want to start, which is, have you always been an athlete? I went to a very small private school, mm-hmm. elementary school, and so being able to you know do anything athletically made me an elite athlete <laughs> at this very small school. I think my first word was ball. Really? According to my mother. I wow. uh, can't confirm that. But uh, so I've been obsessed with, with sports since I could yeah. talk. Obviously, you're sports obsessed, but were you a really academic uh, person as well? Uh, my mother uh, is an academic. Mm-hmm. She always pushed us very hard at school and she's also a scientist and that sort of led my sister and I to both fall towards the sciences it also helps that I have no artistic skills Mm -hmm. really of any kind so sort of a default so paint a picture for me kids little high school what are we uh what are we doing for fun well I was a bit of a loner uh coming out of private school and going to a very large public school. If it weren't for my big sister, Mm. uh, I would have been in a heap of trouble socially. So I I actually ended up leaving that school because I got into the outdoor ed program called Trek. Mm -hmm. And my life completely switched in a huge way that year. I went from being a very shy kid with few friends to being a a much more, well, that's not exactly who I am now. Shy Mm -hmm. wouldn't be the first word you'd use to describe me. But it all shifted on in that one year in outdoor ed class. I ended up going to a different high school after that, finishing at Prince of Wales High School. So this is in late high school. You're finishing up. You have an academic family. You're going to go to university. It's kind of a given. Yeah. I don't really have a choice. Yeah. Uh, I told my parents I was going to take a year off to travel and do all the fun Mm -hmm. things and then realized, one, all my friends are going to university. And two, I had no money. Yeah. So the whole take a year off to travel thing fell yeah. through at the last minute. And I jumped on my UVic uh, acceptance late mm. and, uh, and started there. So you didn't really have much choice about university. It was a family given. But the discipline, did you know what you wanted to study as soon as you arrived? Or was that a process of finding yourself? Yeah, definitely <laughs> was not a budding oceanographer. Yeah, uh, when I started. So I knew I wanted to do science and I knew I wanted to do environmental-ish science. I feel mm-hmm. like a lot of students probably feel that way. Mm-hmm. I was always better at chemistry than both biology and physics. I ended up in geology, my whole degree, essentially, you know, rock formations, rock identification. Big fan of the fieldwork stuff, mm-hmm. I, but I was really bad at mineral identification. Okay. And even worse at like understanding the formations. And yeah, so it was never super passionate about it and then so my stepfather 
mm-hmm. was an oceanographer. Um, and he told me about his Arctic field work. Super cool stories about mm-hmm. going all around the world to study oceanography. And I was pretty excited about yeah. that. And so in third year university, he got me an interview to go on an icebreaker. Amazing. Um, on the Louis Saint Laurent in 2005. I went on uh, five weeks in the Beaufort Sea, mm-hmm. collecting water samples like a bottle filling yeah. kid. Mm-hmm. That was the shifting point for me uh, in terms of a career choice. Mm-hmm. And then I shifted into the brand new ocean science minor program at UVic that had just okay. started. And um, yeah, the rest was history. Okay. And then was graduate school in oceanography an easy decision after that? Or were you still kind of thinking, think about that year off you missed? Did the year off this time. Okay. Because I had money. Yeah. Because they paid well to go yeah. on the ship and you don't spend any money out there. No. So my last year I did an eight week stint on an icebreaker, which is way too long. Yeah. If you're wondering, <laughs> don't do that. But at the rate, the daily rate, it just seemed like give me the max days that you'll sure. give me. And didn't really know what to do with myself until I found out, thanks to, I think my mom told me that you get paid to go to grad school. That was like a shock. Yeah. You know, um, like paid to go to school. School was the only thing I was really any good at. So that seemed like an obvious yeah. decision. So how did you uh, choose? Where did you almost go? Well, uh, you know, I'd done UVic. I'm, I didn't want to go to UBC. Yeah, I can live at home. No That's right. Live at home. And that leaves you with McGill, mm-hmm. was never good at French, despised it, mm. regretfully. Uh, so that leaves St. John's in Halifax, really. Yeah. And so I Googled chemical oceanography, wanted someone that did field work because mm-hmm. I was important to me. And there was really only one person. So I mm-hmm. emailed him and he said, come on out to Halifax, go on a April cruise in the North mm-hmm. Atlantic. Yeah. You have a hard time finding volunteers for that. <laughs> yeah. Which I found out why <laughs> later. <laughs> So I flew out here. He flew, he flew me out here. I went on the ship for three weeks, and mm-hmm. um, then I started in September. Okay. What was the uh, coastal change like? How did you find Halifax at the time, especially after living in Victoria? I'm curious to know what, what was the comparison like. Halifax was a lot different in 2009. Mm-hmm. It was a, yeah, a smaller town vibe. And Victoria was like that too, but the people are different here mm-hmm. in a good way. But uh, I was ready to leave after a year or two and finish what I was calling a sub par master's degree was yeah. what I was working on at the time. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping to just finish it. You're grinding. I was playing a lot of sea dog soccer. Yeah. <laughs> let's put it that way. As much priorities weren't, um, I wasn't, I guess I just wasn't that into it. I was just, wasn't going that well. And then things just sort of changed. I started dating a woman who I am now married to. That's helpful. And my project took a turn. Like it got much more interesting. My data, yeah. I got some great data that I was basically strong-armed by my committee into becoming a PhD student. I imagine you do that now to students yeah, fairly often. So tell me about the project and how it took a turn. What, what do you do? You know, you mentioned bottle samples. You're just like filling a bottle of water, analyzing it, just plotting that on a thing. You have no idea where you're going with it. Yeah, that, and that's all, chemi- that's all <laughs> chemical oceanography is. If you want to be a marine chemist, you fill up a bottle with seawater and you run it through a machine. And there's something in that seawater you're kind of interested in. And the mm-hmm. machine will tell you how much of that mm-hmm. stuff is in there and throw it on an Excel plot <laughs> to the dismay of your physics colleagues <laughs> who all code and you don't. And yeah, so my project was, I wanted to do ocean acidification. Mm-hmm. I forgot to mention that part. I thought that was super interesting. Yeah. I had been in the Arctic a lot. It yeah. was a big deal in the Arctic already back in the early 2000s. And so I think I wanted to figure out ocean acidification in the Arctic. That was like my goal okay. when I started. Sure. You know? Yeah. Big, high. Somewhat lofty. Somewhat impossible <laughs> goal. Good. You don't realize yeah. how, how incredibly focused and unfun your grad project will become. Right. At first, you think it's going to be big and awesome. So I, so I signed up with a a lab that did ocean acidification Mm -hmm. research. I was, so I did collecting samples to understand uh, CO2 levels in seawater. But at the same time, we were collecting other samples for something called radium, which is this naturally occurring radioactive element in seawater. And it was helping us understand how waters are moving. We call it a water mass tracer. Sure. So I was coupling those two things together and collecting those samples on the ships on the shelf Mm -hmm. here 
and you asked me how it turned. So yeah, so my data sets out here were never great. Mm -hmm. The quality wasn't great. I never found anything uh, that I, I really got all that interested in. And then we did a project in the Bedford Basin, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool because that's where I, I'm working now and where our team's working now. And found a pretty cool little story about how CO2 is coming out of sediments at the bottom of Bedford Basin in a bigger way than perhaps had been thought of before. And it was attached to this really cool event where water sort of flushes into the harbor really intensely in the fall. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was a really cool story, a very tight little package story that I published. That was my first ever publication. Mm -hmm. But at the same time that that was happening, I went to the North Sea in Europe because my boss was a man named Helmut Thomas. And he used to study in the North Sea and was still doing work there. He asked me to come and collect samples and, and, uh, as part of a different project. But he needed someone who knew how to do it in mm -hmm. a really awful environment to yeah. work. The North Sea is just brutally rough. And so I spent three weeks on a Dutch vessel mm -hmm. and collected data that I thought would be for someone else because I was hoping to finish. Sure. And when that data came back and I sort of presented it to my committee as like, hey, here's what I did last summer. They were like, this is a beautiful data set. You can't give this to someone else. you got to yeah. use. And they were just trying to convinced right. me to stay. to stay it was very effective yeah and so i still searched on that like a lot of grad students do yeah but eventually made the decision to switch into a phd so your project took a turn you got this great data set and and what happens after that you you, you got everything you wanted out of that data set i guess i became a bit more confident mm -hmm. in my ability to be a researcher and i don't know i just the department at dalhousie the oceanography mm -hmm. department was so much fun Mm -hmm. I was like completely interwoven into the social fabric of the department, which was super strong. I just loved it. It was mm -hmm. super fun. So despite all this fun, you became a pretty serious academic. You decided to go the the hard route. You're gonna do you're gonna go all the way. Yeah, that was the logical next step. So I found a postdoc at UBC in a totally different field. Mm -hmm. And what was this new field? Uh, it was satellites. Mm -hmm. So NASA does a ton of ocean science, understanding temperature of the ocean, biological activity in the ocean. Yeah. And we go out on ships and sort of validated those right. satellite measurements by taking, yes, water samples yeah. and uh, filtering them and running them through instruments. Same old story. Mm -hmm. And you want to keep going. Faculty positions, are they, they're falling in your lap. <laughs> uh, let's see. I was told by my partner, no USA. Okay. Not moving wow, to the that's US. closing a big door. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But I, I understood. I mean, yeah. as you're going to find out in a minute, I didn't follow that uh, <laughs> at all. But yes, that was a request. Not even sure I had applied anywhere else when the University of Alaska job came up. Yeah. So I had an interesting conversation with my partner about what constitutes the U.S. Alaska, very yeah. different. Out of the lower 48. Correct. Yeah, you even got the right terminology there. So we, it was kind of a no, like, no, we're not going to do yeah, that. Yeah. But when they invite you to come for the interview and they allow you to bring your, yeah, whoever you want, your partner, they want you to bring your partner because they want to convince her mm -hmm. and you. It was like a sales pitch, a three-day sales pitch. Totally. My partner had a great time. Mm -hmm. By the time we got home, we were like, wow, maybe we, yeah. maybe we do want to move to Alaska. I mean, all the puzzle pieces of your life do suggest that Alaska would be a good choice. The wilderness and the, you know, the adventure. Yeah, exactly. It fit, it fit our lifestyle. However, it's Fairbanks, Alaska. Mm -hmm. So we're talking right smack in the geographic middle of the state, yeah. which is a nine hour drive from the ocean, yeah. which is a big change for me. Yeah. Uh, I still got to spend a lot of time on the ocean because I was still going on ships, mm -hmm. but that was a tough thing to get past. Yeah. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, lots of open space, mm -hmm. lots of adventures to be had. You also had these two different disciplines that you had experience in now. So what, how did you choose what you were going to do? I didn't. Uh, I became a biogeochemist, okay. which is that <laughs> great word we use in our field to just be like, anything can fall <laughs> into that category. So I call myself one of those. Yeah. And then I did both things. So I had yeah. two different research sure. streams. So what tempted you away from there back to Halifax? Oh, there was a few things. Um, let's see, where do you start COVID? I guess what tipped the scale was the Delta variant was like 
now we're in a whole other round of COVID mm -hmm. and it felt like, okay, this isn't actually going to end anytime mm -hmm. soon. Yeah. And it was really bad there. So we've been back into isolation mode and, um, I think, yeah, that coupled with our kids starting to go to school soon, yeah. you know, we just, we just had had enough. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we were ready to jump and then it, you know, I understandably it was, it was tough because people in there had invested a lot in me. I was yeah. succeeding as a professor there. A lot was going well. So me leaving didn't go over super well. Yeah. And you had students as well that maybe were depending on you. I did. I did. And, and that was really challenging, really mm -hmm. tough. Part of it's the opportunity to do the work here. Yeah. I mean, I, like I say, we were ready to jump and then this job came up. And so, yeah, one friend just said, Hey, I'm working on this project with this cool company. I think that there might be hiring for a chemist. You should yeah. look them up. And like four weeks later, I had the job. Yeah. Pretty exciting job in terms of timing. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that uh, you're doing with the company? Yeah. So undoubtedly the timing was, was incredible, but also the work. I mean, I was preparing for my chemical oceanography course, the subsequent semester, I was building lecture material. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I hear about this thing called ocean alkalinity enhancement that I had never heard of mm -hmm. that seemed super cool. And I told them in my interview, I was like, well, even if I don't get the job, at least you've given me like three lectures sure. of material here <laughs> yeah. because this is fascinating. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the idea of this field that was emerging and the idea of sort of being uh, the leading edge of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, of course, being back in Halifax mm -hmm. sounded really great. And the job required, I work really closely with Dalhousie mm -hmm. and I... Like I said, when I was here, I was so ingrained in the social fabric of the department that I knew everybody. And so it was like, oh, it's a dream scenario. I still get yeah. to be a researcher and I get to work on this exciting new thing and I get to be back in Halifax. I mean, it was a no brainer. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about ocean alkalinity enhancement and what the objectives are, what the pitch is? Because <laughs> it's a company. I'm glad oh, you that word. Don't make me do a pitch. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the basic premise of it is that the oceans already naturally take up about a third of all the CO2 we put in the air. All that natural uptake of that carbon dioxide is what has made the oceans 30% more acidic than they used to be uh, because that CO2 reacts and becomes an acid. So that process of natural CO2 uptake has been happening for you know, billion years. And it's what has made the oceans, the chemical makeup that they are now. This process of the oceans naturally taking up CO2, it happens because rain falls on rocks, dissolves those rocks, mm -hmm. and those rocks end up in rivers that ends up in the ocean. And that dissolved rock is alkaline. So that is a natural alkalinity delivery process that is completely shaped our climate for millions of years. Mm -hmm. If we can just do that faster, right. sort of artificially deliver more rock that is alkaline to the ocean, it will naturally take up more CO2. Right, because it offsets the acidification by the CO2, right? Yeah, that's almost like a great bonus. Mm -hmm. So yes, you, you, will, you are intentionally making the oceans less acidic. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. And in the process of doing that, they become more able to take up CO2. The net result is an ocean with slightly more carbon in it, like almost indetectably less mm -hmm. than you had before, because there's already so much mm -hmm. in there. And the oceans are slightly less acidic, uh, which we need. Um, we don't need it, but but it's a real problem. And if it were you know deployed on a big, big, big scale, mm -hmm. you could start making a dent. Yeah. And it's really important to stress the fact that it would be a dent. Uh, it's not a silver bullet. It's one of many solutions that could help. Right. All of which are completely useless without emissions reduction, because that's how we're going to get most of the way there. But on top of that, we need to take some of the CO2 out that's mm -hmm. already there if we want to stand any chance of the worst impacts of, of climate change, mm -hmm. avoiding those. So the really quick version of it is that we're accelerating the Earth's natural process of taking up CO2 and storing it in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And because the oceans are by far, by far, far the biggest reservoir of carbon on the Earth's surface, 
the oceans are the place to store all this carbon we've put in the atmosphere. And this way of doing it, um, this is what this is what convinced me to put all my energy into this solution. Because like I said, there's five or six different ways of removing mm-hmm. CO2 from the air. One of which is very close to your heart too, David, iron fertilization. Mm-hmm. That's been around for 30 years. Mm-hmm. And we remember the experiments off the West Coast yeah. of Canada, and they were a disaster. Mm-hmm. And um, artificially changing the biology of the ocean has never sat well with sure. me. So do you not see alkalinity enhancement as a geoengineering tool, or would you not put it under the same umbrella? Because it oh, doesn't I, have that biological aspect to it. If you have to label it, it is a geoengineering tool. Mm-hmm. I think you sh- we should be honest and upfront about that. But it is intentionally changing the ocean's chemistry Mm -hmm. and not the biology. Now, there may be side effects that impact the biology and Mm -hmm. those need to be, you know, really carefully uh, studied and and monitored. But, you know, another way of thinking about it is that the ultimate goal is to take CO2 out of the sky. And so that's a chemical process. You can get to that point by changing the biology and that in turn changes the chemistry. Mm -hmm. You can also change the physics. You can artificially pump water from the deep ocean to the surface. Mm -hmm. That will change the biology, which will then change the chemistry. Mm -hmm. Why would you do the complicated ones? Mm -hmm. If the goal is to change the chemistry, do the chemistry and just do that. I mean, by no means what we're doing simple, Mm -hmm. but it's more direct. Mm -hmm. And you aren't intentionally changing the ocean ecosystem. And I I also want to say, like, this ocean alkalinity enhancement isn't, going to work in a vacuum. Like it mm-hmm. needs to be yeah. part of a portfolio, and maybe that does include iron. Who knows? The type of uh, research and experiments that you guys are doing now as a company, are these to understand the process or the process's side effects or both? Both. So we've been in the lab now for a couple of years, and Dalhousie was in, the, in their lab, and it works in the lab. You put a beaker of seawater, put some alkaline material in there, you're going to take CO2 out of the air mm-hmm. every time. It's great. Chemistry beautifully predictable uh, in that regard, but the ocean is a huge, diluting, moving, complicated place and is not a beaker. So will the process work? And more to the point, will it work in the same efficiency Mm -hmm. as it does in a beaker? Probably not. Mm -hmm. What is that efficiency? You know, loss, is it, you know, is it big, is it small? So that's the first sort of pillar of, Mm -hmm. of of what we need to understand. But Right beside that is the, yeah, unintended consequences, right? Mm -hmm. Are there any? What are they? Uh, How acute are they? At what levels will they show up? A lot of research being done there, too, already. Um, So far, fairly optimistic about what's coming out in the the literature. But, you know, you can't culture an animal or a plant. uh, And and again, you can't transfer that to the real world in the same way you can't transfer the chemistry. So you have Mm -hmm. to... You have to start doing those sorts of measurements in an actual field setting sure. with real field ecosystems. But again, at, at like really small levels. Sure. And so the sort of working hypothesis is that nothing's going to happen mm-hmm. um, because it's just such a small signal. Sure. And that's going to be really challenging to work on such small signals because if you can't measure anything, then what are you doing? Yeah. But that, But that's the only way to go. You can't. You can't just go big right away. Yeah. So is the first objective to use the, the basin as a microcosm for for everything else, to be able to predict everything that happens in the basin and then measure it and verify that your model is correct? That's a good way to describe it. It gives us a much better chance of finding those really small signals I talked about. Mm-hmm. The, the water in this little harbor will stick around long enough uh, to make those measurements. I can get down to the pier to make those measurements in, in eight minutes instead yeah. of nine hours like it used to be in Alaska. Yeah. So being right in the heart of the city is really a big deal for that. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. not um, trivial. So in the first few trials that you guys have done in Halifax Harbor in front of everyone, you've used this pink dye. Did you find that people were asking more questions or you're getting more community engagement in your company and in in the project big time and that's actually been a great part of those early dye tracer experiments is that it's putting us much more front and center you know once you turn part of the basin pink for a few hours Mm -hmm. people are much more aware now Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a really good thing because the last thing you want is for people to you know oh my gosh 
you put alkaline material in the ocean. Why wasn't I informed? Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, every eyeball is, is a good one. The first step is making people aware and at the same time, making sure they have the whole story, Mm -hmm. um, because this is a really complex issue. Do you think part of this whole experience also tie into sort of the general climate anxiety that people are feeling? Have you, have you noticed a resonance there with that? Oh my gosh. I mean, this new world that I'm in is, uh, is a really intense one. You know, I've had people who are climate activists get very upset with me Mm -hmm. about the kind of research that we're doing, which always is very frustrating Mm -hmm. because it kind of feels like we're all on the same team. Mm -hmm. Uh, At least I want to believe that. This is people feeling anxious about the geoengineering aspects of the research? Yes. And it's people who think that engineering solutions is going to detract from the things we need to be doing, Mm -hmm. which is emissions reduction. And on one hand, you can see that logic. It's logical. But, um, you know, if you meet the people behind it, the 18 of us, planetary technologies behind it, like the the one thing that I'd love to try and get across to people is that probably the best thing about my job now is that I get to work on the climate problem every single day. You know, and that's I'm using all of my scientific background for you know a couple of decades, all towards this one problem that I feel is really scary and really big. And so that's why everybody in our company is there. You know, this is becoming a pretty desperate problem, and and it's exciting and super motivating to work on it every day. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like you're on the front lines of climate change? We're on the front lines of climate solutions, or mm-hmm. one of them. Yeah. And I, I, you know, 2023 has been a challenging year for me because we're going out there now and, and doing this or trying to. And, you know, I've had a lot of people push back mm-hmm. on it. And um, I don't take that sort of stuff super well because I'm a fairly, like, emotional person. And I like to be, I like it when people like me, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, uh and so it's been super challenging. And I guess what I always come back to is I'm not going to pretend like I'm, you know, a trailblazer of the world, but trailblazing ocean alkalinity enhancement, I think is a fair statement. And there's a reason they call it trailblazing. Mm-hmm. It's really hard. Yeah. But I am so into it now. I'm just so motivated by it. And, you know, it may turn out that ocean alkalinity is not the solution. Mm -hmm. And and I hope we find that out soon so we can move on to something else. But, you know, so far it's going great. And because it's got the scalable part to it, if we can succeed and if we can make something of this, like it it could be a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. Ocean alkalinity is definitely a solution. Get it? Whoa, there's some chemistry. (laughs) I should work for your marketing department, actually. Uh, So what has been the biggest change in the way you work now that you're working in industry rather than being at the university? So fast-paced, right? Anybody at Dalhousie Oceanography Department, I'm becoming well-known as the guy who's making everybody move uncomfortably fast. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's that's been really challenging to be on that side and, Mm -hmm. and push for, for speed, because I know that science is a slow moving process um, and, and, and it has to be rigorous. So that's been a big change. Mm-hmm. And, and my role at the company is to strike that balance yeah. of being like, hey, folks, we can only move this quickly. And that happens to be a lot faster than, than how the science would probably move otherwise. But there's a limit to that. Uh, yeah. How do you balance uh, the need for speed? right, to to deploy these solutions and and test them and validate them with the more traditional rigor of of the academic publishing setting, for example. Yeah, I don't think I, I don't know the answer to that yet. Mm -hmm. But in in the Dalhousie setting, it's great because everyone here knows me, Mm -hmm. right? They know me fairly personally. So they know that despite my desire to move faster, they also know that I'm a decent human being underneath that yeah. and that there's a trust mm-hmm. and that's a big, huge part of it that there's a, a, it's backed on, on this trust that, that 
when I say that we're acting responsibly, there's a, there's a trust level there. Sure. I don't have that with everybody um, outside of Dalhousie, certainly, but trust is a big part of it. And I think that we, as a company, have a code of conduct. I believe it's the first bullet point is follow the science. Mm -hmm. And that science gets published. And frankly, this sort of work is, is actually accelerating the way in which we publish. A, a lot of people aren't going to publish in journals that take two years yeah. to go out. They're mm -hmm. going to publish places where the preprint comes out right away. Yeah. So the science is not peer reviewed yet, but it's out there and we can read it and learn from it. Right. And it's, so it's, that's an accelerator. And those sorts of things are happening because there's recognition uh, that that balance needs to be struck. Yeah. So in that way, it's great because mm -hmm. we're we're making some good progress and and making academia more I don't know more right. visible, more relevant. Good. Okay. Well, it's been really interesting talking to you today. Thanks a lot for coming and chatting with me. It's been my pleasure. It's been really fun. That's a wrap on season five of Sciographies. We want to thank all of our listeners for following along with us and, of course, all of our guests for sharing their personal and professional stories. And a special thank you to our partners at CKDU who help us get these episodes out into the ether. Our producers, Nicole Killowee and Jocelyn Adams-Moss, who plan, edit, and promote each episode. I just show up. Our graphic designer, Luke Smith, and our photographer, Nick Pierce. If you're missing Sciographies, you can listen to any of our 36 episodes wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, David Barkley. Thanks for listening. Sciographies is brought to you by Dalhousie University's Faculty of Science and CKDU 88.1 FM in Halifax, Nova Scotia. You can learn more about Sciographies at dal.ca slash Sciographies.